it's very simple, but doesn't completely capture all of the, the reality. Uh, the, sim the uh, simplest analytic expression that captures profiles reasonably well is the Pearson 4, which has four moments, uh, and those moments are generally tabulated in tables. We also uh, presented the idea of Monte Carlo uh, or uh, numerical solutions, for example, Monte Carlo simulation, uh, which is uh, very quite accurate, and another thing called the Boltzmann transport equation solution. Um, the other thing we um, <clears throat> mentioned is that there's this process called ion channeling. Ion channeling itself is a, quite a challenge in calculating profiles. Calculating the profiles pretty accurately into amorphous solids uh, or amorphous uh, materials quite, uh, is, is re reasonably routine. But once you have to model ion channeling, it gets a little tricky. Today I want to cover th things that we didn't get a chance to talk about. We never even talked about last time the physics of the modeling of the ion imp implantation process, the, that is the physical energy loss mechanisms of the ions as they traverse. We want to talk about that. Once we've covered that, uh, we want to talk about damage. How do we model the damage that takes place in the silicon substrate? Um, and how do we anneal it? And then I'll give a very brief introduction to transit enhanced diffusion. The next lecture, uh, next Tuesday, is going to be dedicated to talking about TED, but I'll, I'll at least uh, briefly introduce uh, the topic. Okay, let's go on to slide number two. <clears throat> on the right-hand uh, side of this uh, slide is it's just a schematic picture um, of a cartoon where you're um, shooting an ion into uh, um, a silicon surface. And all these little um, uh, open symbols here represent silicon atoms on some kind of a lattice. You see an ion, which is this dark uh, dark uh, bullet that here. It comes in, and it hits the target. And when it does, it may have some kind of a nuclear collision here. It may collide uh, with the target atom and be deflected. Uh, there'll be some energy loss there. Then the target atom itself is going to be um, recoiled uh, in, 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 and, and, and will have some energy imparted to it. But that deflection is going to then knock the uh, ion a little bit uh, into a different direction, change its direction. And interestingly, you see it going down a path. And right here, after this collision, right here, interestingly, the ion got knocked into a channel, is what we're supposed to represent. You see the ion got, its direction got changed by this nuclear collision. And now it's, it's, wor it's working its way down a little bit of a channel, still losing energy perhaps at a slightly different rate, and still with each collision creating a silicon uh, recoil that, that's been knocked off its lattice. So it's just a very schematic picture. So we're, again, we're bombarding the wafer. The energy of this incoming uh, dark colored ion is typically anywhere, well, the, some of the lowest energy implants being done today are one kilovolt, or maybe even slightly less. So that's very low but that's, that is being done. And some of the highest energy implants for making, oh, in bipolar, they make um, selectively implanted collector regions that are quite deep. Um, they, they can wor work in the one MeV range. So there's a very wide range of the, that people are ion implanting. Typically implants are between, you know, something like 10 to 100 KV, but there, p people do use the full range. Now look at the binding energy of a silicon atom on the lattice. That's only 15 electron volts. So you can imagine that we're coming in with a species that has thousands of times more energy than the binding energy. So obviously, if um, it's quite possible to have you know billiard ball-like collisions where you knock these silicon atoms off of their lattice sites. So the ions collide, um, and they collide elastically, uh, and they have, uh, uh, as a result, we have ion deflections, which I just showed you here, where the ions change their direction. And when you collide, of course, you lose a certain amount of energy. Uh, the ion loses some energy, and it displaces silicon atoms, which we end up calling recoils. In addition to this collision, this, this sort of pool table type of collision uh, of billiard balls, the ions can also uh, suffer sort of an inelastic drag force um, from the target electrons. And so this leads to electronic stopping, where, the, where you lose ion energy, and it actually heats the lattice to a certain extent, uh, because they're in this, this medium that has electrons in it. Um, eventually this ion and all the ions come to rest after they've lost all of their energy in both collisional processes and in this drag force. Uh, and channeling, as I, I mentioned, we talked about last time, along certain directions, ions can travel in the crystal uh, with very few collisions and little drag, so they can go uh, deeper than they would otherwise. And that's, and that's tough to model. So if we go to page uh, three, 
uh, or slide three, uh, how do we model these range statistics? Well, uh, what we do is we write down the total energy loss during an ion trajectory, trajectory, and we write it as a linear sum. So we treat these two processes independently, nuclear um, losses and electronic losses. So we write uh, the rate of energy loss as a function of distance, as this equation, dE by dx, um, uh, is given by, uh, it's a negative number because it's, you're losing energy, n, where n is the target atom density, atoms per cubic centimeter, times the sum of these two um, quantities, s sub n plus s sub e. Uh, again, n is the target atom density. S sub n is a function of energy. It's the nuclear stopping power. Uh, it's, uh, and it has units of energy uh, times area. So it's EV slash uh, dash centimeter squared is a typical unit. And S sub e is the electronic stopping power. Again, EV centimeter squared. And you can see the units work out. If S has uh, units of EV centimeter squared, you multiply it by atoms per cubic centimeter, you get a certain amount of EV per centimeter, or energy loss per unit length, uh, in in going into the crystal. The thing to remember is that these functions, these are in general, these stopping powers are going to be a function of the energy. Um, that is, the rate at which you lose energy is a function of how fast you're going, of how much energy you actually have. Um, if we know S sub n of E as a function, and we know S sub e, the electronic stopping, as a function of energy then you can simply compute the range by doing this integral. So you integrate. The range would just be the integral from 0 to E, uh, E naught, uh, whatever your incoming energy is, your ion of planet energy, say 100 kilovolts, of dE divided by um, the sum of the two um, uh, stopping powers. And the, here, again, the density is a constant number. It's just been pulled out. So you can find the range. Uh, mathematically, if you know the physics of these two stopping powers. So that's where a lot of the modeling uh, has been done in understanding the physics of S sub n and S sub e. And, and we'll first talk about, um, on slide four, we'll talk about nuclear stopping. Uh, it, it, above a certain energy, so it's about half a, half a kilovolt or 500 EV. Now, be careful because we're approaching this range for some of our very lowest energy implants, making very shallow source strain extensions. People are using quite low energies. But if you're above this, it's, it's reasonably valid to model nuclear stopping uh, as a classical two-body collision between um, uh, um, a silicon atom that's sitting still and an instant ion that's coming in with some, uh, some velocity. So it can be bottled as a, uh, just like on a pool table, two balls colliding, uh, using the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum principles that you learned in your basic physics class. Uh, now, why does this have to be above a certain energy? Why is that the case? Well, it turns out if the energy is, is lower than this or significantly lower, then what happens is as this incident ion comes in, instead of sort of looking like a billiard ball, um, a hard sphere model, this ion has time to sort of hang around the target atom. And the interaction is not just like a, um, a hard sphere collision. You have other types of, of interactions. You can have multiple, uh, it interacts with a lattice maybe in, in the sense of it's going slow enough that as it passes by the nucleus, it has a different types of interaction. So um, if you, your energy is low enough, these, these models break down. But the good thing about ion implantation, most of the time, you're, you're well above that, uh, that threshold. So uh, as you remember from your basic physics class, we have an incident ball coming in, hitting another ball that was originally at rest. This incident ion is going to be scattered at some angle. Uh, and you can figure that out once you know the interaction potential, V as a function of R, R being the distance between the two bodies. Uh, once that's known, um, then you integrate that uh, along the path of the ion. You can calculate the scattering angle for the collision, uh, and uh, you, can, you can do it once and then do it uh, look, look in a lookup table. Um, so you apply the basic physics of uh, conservation of energy momentum, you can get these numbers. Again, the interesting thing about ion implantation, of all the processes we talk about in this class, or anyone does in IC Fab, it's the only one where, from first principles physics, you can actually predict something. You don't have too many uh, free variables the way you do in some of these chemical processes. So the, what it boils down to as far as nuclear scattering goes is figuring out what, are the, what is the appropriate interaction potential, the nuclear scattering potential. Well, if you think about these two um, 
bodies, these two, uh, an ion and a silicate atom, with the ion approaching it, the, um, the, the first thing you might think about is, because you know the nucleus is charged, right, and has a certain charge, uh, which is the um, charge on the electron, Q, times its Z number. Okay, so you might imagine that the, the simplest type of potential interaction between these two charged nuclei um, is just the coulombic potential, which is just given by um, the Z numbers multiplied together divided by R. So it's a 1 over R type of uh, good old-fashioned Coulomb potential. That's a little bit too simple, though, because the atom is just not a nucleus. An atom has an electron cloud around it. So the electrons around the target atom a nucleus actually ends up screening the core potential of, of, the, of the nucleus to a certain extent uh, from the incoming ion. So it's, it's not, this is a little bit oversimplified. So what people do is they put in a generalized function f, which they multiply by the classical uh, Coulomb unscreened potential, and then this becomes the screened potential, v is a function of r. f is some generalized function of um, f over a, uh, r over a. Again, r is the distance between the nucleus, uh, the two nuclei. And um, A is a Thomas Fermi parameter, which is related to the Bohr radius. It's some, some function of the Bohr radius uh, times a function of the Z numbers. Uh, so it gives you, A is some measure of the, uh, if you want to call it, the, the, you know, the size of the atom in some way. Um, and R is, of course, the distance between the, the two, the, the colliding ion and, and the silicon uh, atom. So a very common uh, potential that's often used is an exponential function. You assume that the electrons exponentially um, uh, dampen out the Coulomb uh, potential, and the people use what's called a Thomas Fermi uh, potential. So this, this function here, shown on the third equation on slide five, is the Thomas Fermi potential for uh, ion implantation. So it's got a, a 1 over r dependence times an exponential uh, e to the minus r over a, where again, again a is this Thomas Fermi um, screening parameter. So that's potential, that's one that was often used in modeling of ion implantation. <clears throat> so it turns out that when the screening function is instead um, uh, of using exponential, if you use the screening function f just to be a over r, um, then it's, it's, um, it turns out that if this f is just uh, a over r, then this just, the, the potential just goes like 1 over r squared. That's another way of doing the screening function. Uh, in that case, the, the nuclear stopping power can be approximated by a constant. Um, so uh, it, it turns out that this, this number, if you, and if, you, if you want to see that derivation, you can go to this article by Gibbons back from the proceedings at the IEEE uh, oh, um, back in 1968. And in fact, they derive that it can be a constant number um, that depends just on the Z number uh, of the ion, uh, and it's and the mass of the ion and the z number and the mass of the substrate. So this is a simple equation you can use if you're stuck on a desert island. You need to know stopping nuclear stopping power. You can just program this into your calculator. And, and I just did a simple calculation for phosphorus, which has a z number of 15 and an atomic mass of twice that, or roughly of 31. Silicon has a z number of 14 and a mass of tw uh, 28 amu. You plug these numbers in and you do the calculation. I get an S sub n number of about 550 kilo electron volts per micron. So that's how much energy I lose. Phosphorus going in, you know, assuming it's uh, a constant linear number, 550 keV per micron. Just gives you a rough idea. Uh, if you, and that's again assuming uh, a screening function is just a 1 over r type of screening due to the electrons around the nucleus. And in fact, if you go into slide 7, uh, of your handout. This, I took this plot from Mayer and Lau's book. I have referred to Mayer and Lau um, uh, earlier in the, in the course. In fact, handout one has the, um, has the full reference for his, his textbook. And what he's plotting here is dE by dx. So again, that's a keV per micron. Uh, so it's a stopping power. Um, or if you want, uh, you can change both the energy unit and the length unit. It's equivalent to eV for, per nanometer. I, I, I prefer to think of keV per micron, but it's just uh, either way. Uh, and it's on a log-log plot, and the x-axis is the energy of the ion. So, and there are two, um, two different types of stopping powers shown here. Right now, all we've talked about is nuclear, but let's, let's focus on this dashed line here for phosphorus that starts up at 10 keV, and it's about, uh, it's about 500 or so, a little over 500 keV per micron. And then, as you can see, in reality, the nuclear stopping power 
given by this dash line, is actually going down as you go to higher energies. But it, lo and behold, the number we just calculated in our simple calculator, uh, again, assuming atomic Fermi screening uh, function of 1 over R, comes out at low energies to give you pretty close, asymptotically, to what people calculate with more sophisticated uh, screening functions. Uh, indeed, my calculation here of 550 keV per micron at 10 kilovolts, it's pretty darn close to that dashed line for phosphorus. So it's interesting, and you can check it out yourself for arsenic. Again, you know the Z number in the mass. You can check it out to see how accurate uh, at low energies it asymptotically approaches. Um, so uh, what do we notice? Well, obvious, uh, arsenic is a very high uh, Z number, a high mass element, and its nuclear stopping power is quite large. It's on the order of uh, 1,000 kV per micron, something like that. Uh, phosphorus is being less, and boron nuclear stopping uh, even lower, an order of magnitude lower uh, than for arsenic. Uh, the other thing on this plot um, are these, so besides these nuclear stopping powers, all the ones uh, sub N are nuclear, these straight lines that increase with energy, these are the electronic stopping powers, and we'll talk about that next. This is, due, this is uh, the type of stopping that's due to the drag force of the electrons in the substrate. So let's go on to uh, slide eight and talk exactly about that. This, this sort of non-local, uh, why is it non-local? Well, the nuclear stopping power is local in the sense of you're having a collision, the uh, ion is coming very close to the, to the uh, atom in the substrate, you're having a deflection. So it's, it's an actual um, physical uh, uh, collision and they interact by this Coulombic force. This is a non-local uh, phenomenon uh, called uh, uh, non-local or local electronic stopping, and there are two ways of viewing it. Uh, you can imagine uh, some kind of drag force caused by the fact that I have a charged ion coming in, it's going at some velocity, so it's As plus, arsenic plus, or boron plus, boron uh, uh, minus, is, is, is in this sea of electrons. This sea of electrons, where, where do they come from? Well, every atom um, in, the, in, in the crystal um, has electrons associated with it. In fact, there are covalent bonds. Uh, there are four covalent bonds uh, for every silicon atom with eight electrons participating, you know, uh, per bond, I mean, per, per atom. Uh, uh, and these covalent, these, these covalent electrons are, are essentially can produce um, a retarding effect uh, on, the, on the ion going through it. So you can think of it as sort of a retarding field. Uh, imagine the silicon or the substrate as sort of a, some kind of dielectric medium. You have an ion co coming through it at some velocity. This, this is a blue uh, circle is meant to represent, say, the boron uh, or the arsenic ion. And there's this retarding uh, electric field. Uh, so the interesting thing, the thing you need to note, the main point is this, this is a dissipative loss mechanism, but it doesn't change the direction. The electrons are way too light. Uh, they're, they're very, very light. They can retard or slow down the ion, but they're not going to change its direction. There's no deflection as a result of this, uh, so unlike nuclear scattering. So that's one way of thinking of it as a drag force in a dielectric medium. The other way is you can imagine a quote-unquote collision. Now just be careful in the word collision, the use of it, with electrons around the atoms transferring some momentum to those electrons uh, from the electrons uh, in the, uh, uh, from, from the, the ion itself. So you can imagine, uh, you're, here's this target atom, it's got these electron cloud around it, and it's uh, it transfers momentum um, and actually results in locally slowing down um, this, uh, um, this ion, basically, uh, reducing its velocity. Uh, again, there's no change in this mechanism, no change in the direction of, of, the, of the incoming ion when, it, when this, this process happens. Uh, so both of these uh, don't change direction, and both mechanisms uh, are related to or involve the speed or the velocity of the ion. Okay, so if we go to the um, next slide on slide nine, to first order, people have found they can write the electronic stopping power as some constant times the velocity. So the, this drag mechanism, the KEV loss per micron due to electronic stopping, increases pr directly proportional, uh, proportionally uh, to the velocity of the electron. And what is the velocity? Well, the velocity just goes like the square root of energy, right? Um, so you can write electronic stopping as some constant k times the square root of e. And in fact, k has this very roughly, you can approximate k by about uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 14th square root ev centimeter squared. Uh, 
as shown up on the top of that slide. So this is an approximation, but to first order, it seems to work. Um, I should note here, I'm noting in the upper right corner, that a lot of the improvements in ion implant modeling over the last five, 10 years, or however long, have actually come from a better, a more accurate treatment of electronic stopping. Nuclear stopping is very much nuclear physics, and that's been known for a long time now. Uh, but this electronic drag force is a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more difficult to model, and, and this is where a lot of the improvements have come uh, in, in, in the literature. And, and particularly, this affects light ions like boron, which, for which most of this stopping is actually electronic. Boron isn't very heavy. It doesn't experience that much nuclear stopping. Most of what slows down a boron ion implanted into silicon is electronic stopping. So boron profiles have become more accurate, more accurately modeled over the last X number of years because people have a little better models for electronic stopping. So if we look at this plot on, on slide nine, this is the total stopping power. It, it, it plots both the nuclear and electronic. So again, the units are keV per micron in the vertical axis and a keV on the y axis. And these are the same plots I just showed you. They're just different color. Here's arsenic nuclear stopping, phosphorus nuclear, boron nuclear stopping. And here's the electronic stopping. Um, and again, it's uh, just re basically proportional to the velocity. There's only a small dependence, and we don't even show it here on the type of ion. So we're just writing this as this, uh, this black line. So interestingly, uh, what you see, an interesting energy to point out is the energy at which these lines cross. And that's called the critical energy, E sub C. And at that point, the nuclear electronic stopping are equal. Uh, beyond that, the electronic stopping has actually taken over. It's much larger. Because again, the nuclear stopping power is going down as you go, go faster, uh, but, uh, or increases as you go slower. But the electronic is going the opposite direction. So boron at 17 keV, above that uh, or below that energy, uh, basically nuclear stopping will be important. Above that energy, which is a lot of our implants, um, boron is pretty much being stopped by electronic stopping. Uh, phosphorus, it's about 150. So any energy um, less than 150, you're going to be dominated by um, nuclear stopping. Above that will be um, electronic. And arsenic is almost always dominated, uh, at least in the beginning of its path, uh, by nuclear stopping. The interesting thing about this, though, think about an individual ion. As an ion comes in, of course, it comes in with a lot of energy, right? 10 keV, 100. But by the time it stops, it's got zero. So every ion has to traverse. As I first come in, let's say I start coming in at 10 keV, and I'm, uh, uh, or I'm rather, uh, 100 keV, and I'm right here. Um, so as I'm coming in um, here uh, for, for boron, you'd say at 100 keV, well, um, electronic stopping is dominant. That's true. But as the boron ion slows down, it walks down this curve and it walks up this point. And when it gets to very low energies just before it stops, in fact, nuclear stopping always takes over. Because uh, at low energies, you really can have a lot of uh, billiard ball-like collisions. So that's why at the end of the range, uh, back at the, you know, at the depths of the implant that's near the end of range, there's a lot of nuclear stopping that goes on. And, and we'll talk about what impact that has for, for damage profiles. Here's just an example on page uh, 10 a different type of plot. That was a log-log plot. I've plotted these nuclear and electronic now on um, linear axes, just so you get a feel for what they look like on linear. So this is dE by dx, and uh, this is, well, it's actually it's a square root of energy. Uh, and that helps linearize the, uh, this straight line, of course, then is the electronic stopping. Um, and this um, other line here, that it peaks at some energy E1 and then starts to decrease down, that's the nuclear stopping. So on a linear scale, you can actually see what it looks like. And again, I took this from Mayer and Lau's textbook. In general, the nuclear stopping dominates, as we said, at low energy towards the end of the range. Um, and that's the, the location of the, of the, uh, in, this, in, the, in the substrate where the nuclear collisions are going to produce most of the damage. So we call that end of range damage. At very high energies up here, when I'm up, up here, particles travel very quickly they have less time to interact with a nucleus. So nuclear stopping is not, very, is not as important. Um, they have less interaction time, uh, and so you tend to, they tend to be dragged down. Nuclear stopping is going down with energy where electronic is, is increasing. OK, so that gives you an idea of some of the um, physics of the loss mechanisms. So let's go on to slide 11. So I have these, let's say I have these nuclear stopping powers as a function of energy, and I have the electronic. 
how do I get from that to a calculated profile? Well, we know you just simply need to do this integral um, if, if you want to compute the range. Uh, or um, you can directly from Monte Carlo simulations, you can actually simulate those that billiard ball and those electronic stopping processes. Um, many years ago, um, three folks, Lindhard, Scharf, and Shia, actually uh, took these equations, put in uh, nuclear and electronic stopping powers, and computed uh, the moments of distributions given uh, S sub n and S sub b. And in fact, that so-called LSS theory generated these tables. I think we showed these tables last time for uh, common dopants in silicon, generated tables of the first few moments, maybe the, the first three moments, it generated RP, this delta RP, or the standard deviation sigma, and the skewness gamma. They are tabulated, and they were calculated originally by LSS, um, and, or they've been fit to experimental data. But you can calculate these moments um, from first principles physics uh, estimates of S sub n as a function of energy and S sub e as a function of energy. Okay, so that's basically how, how people do the calculations. Uh, they, they, uh, when it boils down to, the calculations boils down to, boil down to how accurately do I know the nuclear stopping power as a function of energy and electronic stopping. If I know that, I can use a computer, you can regenerate the old LSS statistics, or you can actually use a computer to do Monte Carlo um, simulation. Uh, because once once you know those stopping powers. Uh, given that, okay, so we, 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 we can figure out where the ions end up in the lattice. Now we want to know about what kind of damage does this incoming ion come uh, coming in at a certain energy due to the lattice. So imagine I have 30 kiloelectron volts arsenic, um, which is coming into the silicon lattice. And if you look that up uh, in your table, in your textbook, you'll find it has a range of 25 nanometers. Um, so, or about uh, 250 angstroms. Um, so, in 250 angstroms, actually, you can figure that out. That is equivalent to roughly uh, um, 100 atomic planes. It is about 0.25 or 2.5 angstroms per, uh, per plane, interplanar spacing. Um, so, you can imagine this arsenic ion is coming in. It goes through about 100 atomic planes. Uh, and how many... So, in fact, you can think of this 30 kV arsenic ion is coming in like this. This, is, this squiggly line is meant to represent its path. Here's where it ends up. And you can think of a cylinder around that, um, uh, the sort of a cylinder that represents the region which is, uh, which is damaged because it does a lot of nuclear stopping and you have a lot of recoils generated uh, until it comes to stop. Uh, and, in fact, there's a simplified formula, the KP formula, that people use to figure out roughly uh, the number of displaced particles, so that'd be the number of displaced silicon atoms, created by an incoming ion. And basically, in, in, in simple, you can imagine it might be related to the energy of that ion, which is 300 kiloelectron volts, so that's 30,000 volts, electron volts, and divided by the displacement energy. Um, well, we use a factor of one-half in front of that, but the displacement energy, we said, was 15 electron volts. So just order of magnitude estimate um, by comparing the incoming energy to the energy it takes to displace an atom um, from the lattice. We, we're talking about maybe a thousand recoils of silicon are created by this one arsenic atom. That's, that's quite a bit. So you're essentially doing little ion implants inside, um, uh, inside the substrate every time uh, an arsenic atom deflects uh, silicon. It, it creates what they call silicon knock-ons. Uh, the silicons are knocked on, and they themselves have a certain energy, and they can do more damage. So you, it creates this sort of cylinder-like uh, region of damage, just due to one ion. And in fact, here's a, that was a very schematic uh, cartoon that we just drew uh, with a computer. This is a little more sophisticated on slide uh, 13. These are actually uh, what's called molecular dynamics simulations where people build in the computer, and of course this is done at Lawrence Livermore National Lab where they have huge supercomputing capability. They, uh, they build up a model of the silicon lattice, and they actually model the physics of an incoming atom uh, or ion. Here's a 5 keV boron ion coming in. It's ion implanted into the substrate. And they actually follow a whole bunch of ions and, and actually look at what happens uh, to these displaced recoils. And each little snapshot picture here, I apologize, it didn't come out very well when we copied it, um, is a snapshot in time. So the first little um, cube is supposed to represent a region of the silicon where uh, after 0.1 picoseconds, so this ion has come in, and just at the time of 0.1 picoseconds, there's this little cloud here. 
You can see this little cloud. That cloud represents all the displaced silicon atoms. So they're actually following all, all these atoms displaced from their, their lattice uh, sites. And then at five times that time, so at half a picosecond, look how that cloud has grown. It's gone in deeper, and it's expanded sort of laterally. Um, and then interestingly, uh, 10 times that again, roughly, at six picoseconds, the cloud looks a little bit smaller. It's reached some size, not that much different from its first size, but because why? Well, what's happened is that some of these silicon atoms um, that were knocked off have found that vacant lattice sites, right? So you're creating ions of silicon atoms that are displaced, but you're also, they, they find uh, holes in the lattice where they can sit. Uh, and so this, this becomes sort of what the off-site silicon atoms look like after about six picoseconds. So people actually do try to simulate this from first principles uh, physics as well. So that's a more modern uh, kind of calculation. On uh, slide 14, I'm showing you maybe a little bit more traditional or old-fashioned calculation. What people we used to do in the 1980s, in fact, this was taken from uh, a book called The Handbook on Semiconductors on Ion Implantation, published back in 1980. But what it is, um, it, rather than that, that uh, following every atom and, and figuring out, what people do is they found a way to calculate the energy deposited into nuclear processes. Again, we know the nuclear stopping power as a function of energy. So as we integrate those equations in depth, we can figure out at any given depth, we know the energy of the atom, of the ion, we can, we can kind of integrate that up and figure out um, how much nuclear stopping is taking place at that depth. And therefore, how much you can think of how much of the energy loss um, in, in uh, KeV per micron or EV per angstrom is there at a given depth. Uh, and here's a, a picture of that calculation or a plot. It's so-called damage density. So uh, it's the amount of energy that is lost at a given depth due to nuclear processes. And it has the units of EV for EV per angstrom uh, as a function of depth. And um, this is for a particular ion implant. This is boron-11 being implanted into silicon at 100 kiloelectron volts. And you can see the damage energy, the damage de energy density has a certain profile. Um, and this solid line represents a calculation where it includes the silicon recoils, uh, that is the silicon ions that are generated. And the dashed line is when we have only the primary ions. So there's not much difference in this case. Uh, but here's an example of boron silicon. It's a relatively light ion. Um, and, and the interesting thing that it's plotted here is as a function of X over RP. So remember, RP is going to be roughly close to where the peak of the boron. So the boron would peak here at 1. Um, but the, So the range of the boron atom is actually much greater than the range of the average silicon recoil. Uh, it's because the boron is light, so it can't push the silicon that much deeper in. So actually the damage density for silicon recoils doesn't contribute that much. So you can see that these two dashed and the solid look pretty much the same. But interestingly, where does the, the, the damage peak? Pretty close to RP. In fact, it's just at maybe 80% of RP. And that's a good rule of thumb you can use if you want to know, all right, I'm going to ion implant something into a silicon substrate. Um, maybe I don't know how to calculate the damage energy density, but I can know how to calculate the profile of that ion. Where's the maximum damage? Well, it's close to RP, but in fact, it's just sh shy of RP. Uh, so if you want to do a lot of damage, or usually you don't, but uh, or you want to minimize, you, you can figure out just, just below RP is where you're going to peak uh, in terms of doing the most damage to the substrate. Uh, here's an example on slide 15, a different situation. Um, now this is the heavy ion. The same kind of calculations published in, in Gibbon's book, Handbook on Semiconductors uh, Ion Implantation Volume. Uh, again, damage energy density in EV per angstrom, again, versus X over RP. But look at this this time. The solid line now, again, includes recoils, um, and you get this sort of uh, distribution. The dashed line um, is for the damage done just by the anomaly itself. Uh, and you, you get a very different damage distribution. So what this says is for a heavy ion like anemone, um, anemone is big enough that it can impart a lot of energy to silicon ions, or the silicon recoils. And uh, the silicon recoil, recoils transport a lot of that damage energy deeper into the substrate. So if you don't take it, when you calculate damage and you have a heavy ion coming in, if you don't take into account the silicon recoils, you're going to get pretty somewhat inaccurate distribution of where, the, where the, most of the damage is done. So you really need to use the solid line and include the silicon recoils in your damage because the silicon atoms then go on and, and damage 
further the lattice, they, they, they um, impart energy to other silicon atoms. This is for a 100 kilovolt uh, antimony. But again, look where the peak is. The peak and the damage still occurs at about close to 80% or so of uh, the projected range of the antimony uh, ion. So that's a handy rule of thumb. <clears throat> now, what can we do with a damage energy profile like this, or a damage uh, density versus uh, X, or X over RP? Well, if you know how much damage in a given angstrom, how much energy in a given angstrom will uh, tend to produce amorphization, you can actually use this plot to figure out wh how, wh which part of the lattice is um, which depths are amorphized. And so here's an example. What I'm doing here, I'm taking this calculation, which we showed for boron a couple of slides ago, and I'm assuming that there's a threshold for amorphization. Now, this has been both calculated and people have tried to measure it. I'm assuming the threshold for amorphization at room temperature is 6 electron volts per angstrom. So people have kind of looked at this either theoretically or from um, by looking at actual uh, amorphization zones, amorphous zones, and said that when you get above about 6 electron volts deposited into nuclear processes per angstrom of depth, the silicon has so much damage that it goes amorphous, so it's lost its crystal structure. In fact, if I draw a line here at 6 and I see where it cuts this profile, that would say that this substrate, uh, if you're implanting boron at 100 kilovolts, um, I don't know what the, uh, uh, what the dose was in this particular case, but it, was, it would be amorphized uh, between about half of RP and up to about uh, RP. So in that region between half RP and, and RP, the, uh, between these two lines, it's, it's predicted according to this model, and again, you're, it, it's going to be very sensitive to your amorphization threshold, this region in here will be amorphized. Everything else will be heavily damaged. Uh, so you can see what boron tends to do uh, because of its distribution. Um, it tends to create a buried amorphous layer with heavily damaged single crystal silicon on either side. And I just want to say a little more uh, about amorphization, shown here on slide um, 17. Uh, as, as we've talked about before, if you give it a high enough dose, you have enough of the a crystal is displaced, it becomes completely amorphous. It loses all of its uh, crystal structure. There's no more long range order. At this point, we have a random uh, arrangement. And the damage accumulation is saturated. You really can't talk about damage anymore. Once you've amorphized, there are no lattice sites. So you can't really knock somebody off a lattice site because there is no lattice site. Uh, it's, it's, it's no longer a lattice. Uh, but just gives you an idea. This is um, uh, taken from your textbook. This is a cross-sectional TEM. So this is transmission electron micro micrograph pictures of an amorphous layer formation with increasing implant dose from left to right. So this is a very high energy. It's 300 kilovolts silicon <clears throat> being implanted into a silicon substrate. Uh, so the interesting thing is the ion now is silicon. It has the same mass as the substrate. It's relatively light, though. So here at, at 1E15, what do I see? Well, here's the surface of the silicon substrate. And you see there's this band, this region, where there appears to be darkness. There seems to be a lot of damage, uh, a lot of stuff going on here. Dark contrast, you can imagine, uh, might be associated with some kind of uh, dislocation loops or some kind of uh, damage in the substrate. Here, here's a band here. Now, at one and a half times 10 to the 15th, there's a band which really has, um, it's buried and it's lost its, its crystalline uh, structure. If we were to zoom in here and do a selected area diffraction on this region, we find it's not a crystal. There will be no diffraction Lowy spots, whereas if you go down here, you would see crystalline. Um, here's that amorphous layer at two times 10 to the 15th. It's increased in its width. It still hasn't reached the surface, though. And at four 10 to the 15th, it's, it's increased in depth, but again, hasn't quite reached the surface. 5, 10 to the 15th, mm, almost. And finally, uh, at 10 to the 16th, that's a very large dose, you've created an amorphous layer all the way from the surface down to some depth. I don't know what this is, half micron or whatever. Um, and uh, completely amorphized from the surface um, down. Uh, and this is all um, at room temperature. Uh, it turns out it's much easier to form an amorphous layer at low temperatures. 77 Kelvin. So you will sometimes see people specifying their implant energy. They want to use a special ion implanter that does, if you're doing uh, some of these materials experiments, that can, that can hold the wafer at 77 Kelvin. That means the damage is much more stable. Remember, we were talking about that, that simulation from uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs. You saw all that damage cloud and then a lot of recombination. 
by diffusion and things. Well, if you're at low temperatures, you have a lot less recombination, so the damage tends to be more stable, especially with a light ion. So if you want to amorphize silicon with a light ion like boron or silicon, you pretty much, to do it reliably, you pretty much have to hold the wafer at low temperatures like 77 Kelvin. If you have a, a heavy ion that does a lot of damage like arsenic or antimony, you can easily amorphize a, a layer from the surface down uh, at room temperature. Okay, so let's go on to slide, that's a picture of, of, of damage. Let's go on to slide 18 and talk about um, damage annealing. So uh, we have to do uh, annealing after we do an ion implant because we've bashed up the crystal. So what do we want to do when we anneal? We want to remove the primary damage caused by the implant. You want to put all the dopants onto um, substitutional sites. That way they can, they can be donors or acceptors. Uh, we try to make the crystal uh, uh, as perfect as it was when you first started. It's, you never really get it quite as perfect. Um, we'd also, in doing that, we want to restore the electron and hole mobilities and the carrier lifetime, hopefully, to what it was. And you want to do all these things without really having much dopant diffusion. So it's a tough job. It's a tough job. Um, and this is a model for uh, damage annealing, uh, relatively simple, but that was published back in 1991 that, that is, is very famous now uh, by Martin Giles, uh, which is called the plus one model for residual damage. Kind of a funny name. But what Martin did was he, he said the following things. <clears throat> he said that most recoiled silicon interstitials, so again, we're going to call this guy who's recoiled, who ends up in an interstitial space, uh, um, an eye or a silicon interstitial, most of them will find a vacancy, and they'll recombine very, very rapidly, either during the implantation process or in the first few seconds of annealing. A lot of recombination takes place. Um, in fact, he calculated the distribution of remaining recoils um, after ion implantation without even any annealing. And what he found, there's a net excess of vacancies near the surface and a net excess of interstitials towards the bulk, but there's still a lot of them recombined. So this is a calculation from Giles, and he's got concentration of interstitials uh, and vacancies as a function of depth. The solid line, or this, this line on top here that starts at around 10 to the 20 or, or mid 10 to the 20 and then goes down, um, he, these, are, these are the total interstitials and vacancy concentrations he calculated. They're almost on top of each other. You know, on this log scale, you can't tell the difference. So you create a tremendous number of interstitials, tremendous number of vacancies, but, but most of them all recombined. And in fact, what he's plotted here is the net interstitials. So that's the number of interstitials minus the number of vacancies at a given point. So that's how many are left over. So the net interstitials um, look like this. In fact, if you plot the net profiles here in, in the near surface region, you have net vacancies. So there's, a, there's extra vacancies. Down in deep, you have net interstitials. Um, but the total numbers of these net are as much, much uh, less than what, you know, when you do the subtraction of the interstitials from the vacancies than the total interstitial or vacancies that were actually created. So that's his point. To, you know, within three orders of magnitude, a lot, most of these guys recombine. Uh, so f to first order, what he said is that you can imagine that all of the original damage recombines and leaves behind only one interstitial created for every phosphorus atom or every ion implanted ion uh, that, that is ion implanted. So you can imagine, let's say you are implanting a dose of phosphorus. In this particular example, I guess it's 80 keV 10 to the 13th. He was saying that there's one interstitial created for every phosph phosphorus incoming. So he would say there's 10 to the 13th per square centimeter silicon interstitials created. So, I mean, it's incredibly simple. You just take the dose of the atoms that are implanted, of the ions that are implanted, and say, that's the number of interstitials per square centimeter that I create, 10 to the 13th. Uh, it's called plus one because, you know, and, and intuitively what he's saying is if your implant is totally activated, so every uh, implanted phosphorus ion finds a substitutional site, well, where did that silicon go? It had to knock, that silicon is somewhere as an interstitial. Okay, and that's all he said. He said, assuming your annealing is good, you know what you're doing, to, to first order, so this is to get an order of magnitude estimate. The number of interstitials I create is equal to the dose of what I implanted. So that's pretty simple. I implant 10 to the 15th, I have 10 to the 15th excess interstitials now in my crystal. And that's with the so-called plus one model. Um, this just tells you a little bit more about how accurate that assumption might be. This is on slide uh, number 19. Uh, I took this from your textbook. It's a little bit about 
damage evolution in time. So uh, what it's a plot of is the um, annihilated uh, interstitials, so the recombined ones, and vacancies per implanted ion. Uh, okay. Um, so if we, and, it, and it's kind of as here as a function of, of time. Um, so if you look at, uh, these are Monte Carlo simulations, basically, of interstitial and vacancy recombination. And if you go after a short time, uh, really, um, only excess uh, interstitials remain, and uh, these can f end up forming clusters. But basically, um, this bulk and surface recombination take place on a very short time scale. So look at the bulk recombination uh, very quickly after uh, here, um, after only, well, I don't know, 10 to the minus 6 seconds, was that a microsecond? Um, there's a lot of bulk recombination that's taken place. Surfer surface recombination maybe takes, uh, for vacancies, takes a, a shorter time. And then finally, surface interstitial uh, recombination can take place within uh, a hundredth to one second. So you have a lot of um, uh, interstitial uh, and, and vacancy recombination. That was the point of what Giles was saying. So that only plus one interstitial, uh, excess interstitial remains. Now what happens to those 10 to the 15th? If I unimplant 10 to the 15th phosphorus atoms, I have 10 to the 15th excess interstitials. If the name of the game is what happens to all these interstitials? Well, it turns out they coalesce. They get together into little defects. And these little defects are called, in, in curly brackets, called 311 defects. And we'll talk about in detail next time about 311s. Uh, but the interesting thing about these little clusters, these 311s, they are defects end up being stable for very long periods. So the interstitials come, we have all these excess interstitials. They end up getting together and forming little defects, which then can stay around for 10 seconds, 100 seconds, maybe even minutes and, and hours, depending on the temperature. And it's these little defects, these 311s, then that end up being responsible for the process of trans-enhanced fusion that we're going to model uh, in the next lecture. In fact, uh, on slide 20, just by way of introduction, these are uh, this these are pictures of 311 defects. Um, uh, the right-hand side is an actual uh, high-resolution cross-section transmission electron micrograph, and I can tell it's high-resolution because you can see little these little dots. And they, they form in planes. Well, these little dots, each dot represents two silicon atoms. So you're actually, and they're all lined up in, in sort of planes because you're looking at the crystal planes uh, of, of um, uh, in the silicon lattice. And you see this little funny looking thing right here that's tilted at an angle. It goes from this point here, this dark band of contrast to this point here. That is a, a ribbon-like region that is identified. That is the 311 defect. And that's an actual cross-section TEM micrograph. On the left is meant to represent uh, a color cartoon of what this thing actually looks like. Um, the axis here, along the defect, it re is represented by this vector here. That it turns out to be this vector <laughs> um, turns out to be in the 311 direction. That's how these things got their name. They were tilted in the 311 direction. Um, the long axis of the ribbon, this is a ribbon-like defect, the long axis points along 1, 1, 0 direction in the crystal. That's of a long axis here, you can't really see. It would be into the board or, or into, the, uh, uh, into, the, into the slide. These little uh, round things here, these um, circles, uh, represent uh, interstitials, and they're, they're little dimers. They come in pairs, and they line up along this direction. Could be 100 angstroms long, uh, and uh, it's got some sort of width to it, uh, which you can see here. And it has a certain capture radius within a certain region it will capture these interstitials and form this little cluster. Um, these 311 defects, once they're, they form pretty quickly in a matter of a second or less. But they anneal out in time scale of minutes at moderate temperatures. And as they anneal out, as this, this ribbon heals, it spits out silicon interstitials. And it's these um, silicon interstitials that are coming out of this 311 ribbon uh, that lead to the transient enhanced diffusion effect these excess silicon interstitials. Um, it turns out that below a certain dose or below a certain damage uh, value, these 311 defects can dissolve completely. So you can dissolve them, you can completely get rid of them, and at, at that point when they're completely gone, you have no more TED after that amount of time. You go back to a normal diffusion. Uh, above a certain damage level, actually, it's a little more complicated. They turn into, the, they, uh, they actually get together, they turn into stable dislocation loops which are more difficult or sometimes impossible to remove. That's like end-of-range damage. Uh, 
but there is a certain region in which you can remove all the three one ones. Certain amount of damage. Okay, so when we're going to talk about three one ones and their annealing kinetics in great detail next lecture, when we go through the whole kinetics of uh, transient enhanced diffusion. In the meantime, I want to go on and continue to talk about other aspects of annealing. So we know we create all these interstitials; they get together in three one ones. Um, we know if we go to high enough dose, remember I showed you a picture that we can amorphize the crystal. Well, let's say I do create an amorphous layer at the surface. How can I get rid of that amorphous layer and restore the crystal to perfect or to some kind of crystallinity? Well, this is exactly what happens. I'm showing here um, cross-section TEM images. This layer is originally amorphous from the surface of the wafer down to some depth. And we're regrowing it. So we're annealing the wafer at 525. Uh, the initial implant was quite high. It's 200 kilovolts, 6 times 10 to the 15th of antimony. Again, it's, it's antimony is a very heavy atom, so it amorphizes from the surface down. Um, and we're looking here initially at zero minutes. So I guess that kind of got cut off of the slide, but this should be uh, at, at here at, at zero minutes. So just when you first start. After 10 minutes of annealing at 525, look at this. The interface between the amorphous and the crystal substrate has moved up. So the amorphous layer has actually grown uh, or regrown by a process called solid phase epitaxy. So there's no melting going on, but in a layer by layer method, the atoms in each layer are taking the template from the substrate and rearranging themselves back into single crystal form. And this amorphous layer is progressing up from the depth towards the surface. You can see it as time goes on in kind of a linear fashion uh, in an epitaxial growth. So we call it solid phase epi as opposed to vapor phase. Vapor phase would be if I had I had injecting silane or something and growing epi. Here I just have a solid solution that's regrowing at 525. When you're done, or well, this isn't quite done. At 20 minutes, it's almost done. Maybe half an hour, you would see this the entire region, amorphous region, will have been regrown. It'll be all be single crystal, and you'll be left with something though. There's a band of residual damage that occurs called end of range damage or EOR. And these are defects that are just below the amorphous crystalline interface. So you get an idea of where they are. They, they're always just below that. And those are pretty pretty hard to get out. Those generally don't ever go away. You have a certain amount of that for such a high dose that you have to live with. And you have to find a way to deal with it. Um, this slide on, on page 22 actually shows you from some data from a book, uh, a book by Gibbons and Sigmund called laser annealing of semiconductors. So it's about laser annealing. Uh, the book is. But this particular chapter is about solid phase epi, or solid phase regrowth, just in a furnace. Um, and what they're plotting here is the regrowth rate. So this gives you the number of angstroms per minute uh, as that amorphous layer tra traverses from down below up, the number of angstroms per minute that it goes as a function of inverse temperature uh, for silicon and under different conditions. So let's take a curve here. Let's take this one curve right here that is called 100 silicon undoped as a function of temperature. And you can see for undoped silicon, say at 525, the regrowth rate is about 20 or 30 angstroms per minute. So it's a, it's a constant rate. These people have measured this. There's, there's a technique called Rutherford backscattering ion channeling. You can actually measure this rate going up and you can, you can see how fast it goes. Um, gives you an idea of how that amorphous layer regrows. And um, that's at 525. So you can see amorphous layer regrowth can happen at reasonably low temperatures. You don't have to go too hot. Interestingly, though, there are lots of different curves here. If you go to the 110 silicon, so if you buy a wafer that is 110 surface, instead, uh, you've got a different atomic density on that 110 plane. And in fact, it regrows slower. The same activation energy, Ea of 2.3 electron volts. Uh, interestingly, that, that number is kind of intriguing. That's also what people believe 2.2 is roughly the bond breaking energy. Uh, and so, you know, at, imagine if that interface between the amorphous and the single crystal, you probably have to break some bonds there initially uh, at, in order to realign the atoms. Um, so SPE is pretty fast. It depends on orientation and it depends, what's really interesting, it depends uh, very much so on doping. Uh, so for example, here's silicon that's doped with arsenic you can be um, uh, quite a bit faster, three, five times faster, or even or phosphorus or boron. Here, boron is the fastest, it looks like. Um, if you accidentally put oxygen or nitrogen into your sample, look what happens to the regrowth rate. 
you can go down by almost an order of magnitude. So impurities have a big effect. Um, and uh, which is, which is, argon would even really do it, really frustrates the regrowth. And, and so it's important to know what's in your crystal, what your iron and planning will have a big effect on the regrowth rate. Um, interestingly, when you do this, most of the dopant atoms like arsenic, phosphorus, boron are incorporated as that amorphous layer moves up. They're actually mostly incorporated on substitutional sites, even at low temperatures. So um, it, it turns out if you can create an amorphous layer, this is one of the best ways of activating uh, a dopant. Um, is to create an amorphous layer in silicon. Now, this is the way silicon anneals. Other semiconductors, gallium arsenide, for example, is just the opposite. If you amorphize it, God help you, I'm trying to trying to get the dopants to uh, get re um, to get uh, activated. It's not so easy. But silicon has this beautiful property that as that layer moves up, a lot of the dopant atoms get forced onto substitutional sites, and then the donors and the acceptors are already activated at low temperature to to a great degree. So that's a nice a nice property, assuming you fully amorphize the crystal. Okay, let's go on to slide 23. I mentioned that life is not perfect. Even if you amorphize, um, you, you always end up with this end of range damage. Um, and here's a here's a, a plot on the left of uh, this. Let's say this is the surface of a silicon wafer here, going down in depth. And here's my concentration. And let's say I have implanted something. Maybe it's arsenic. I don't know what. And it has this ion profile. It looks like this. So it, it it's and there is. Um, there's uh, the maximum damage for this particular profile is just below um, the amorphization threshold. So this region from here to here, from the surface down to the what, what's this dashed line is called the amorphous crystalline interface, that's all amorphized. So that's going to regrow layer by layer and give you very good crystal quality. If I just go back a couple slides here, again, um, the uh, amorph it was amorphized to this depth. If you look at this depth when you're done, there are no, there is no residual damage. It's below the initial amorphous crystal interface by some distance that you end up with this end of range, where and it kind of makes sense because uh, at this point you have deposited at right at this depth enough energy to amorphize the crystal. Below that you've deposited a huge amount of energy, but not enough to amorphize. So you've really bashed it up, but it's not amorphous, so it can't regrow by solid phase epi. And instead, it creates dislocation loops, and that's what we call the end of range. So. If I go back to the slide number 23, just below the amorphous region of this end of range damage, and here is my uh, ion planet arsenic. Okay, so now let's say I'm using this to make a, an NP junction. Um, so uh, what I need to do if I'm going to make an NP junction, what I typically want to do is just to diffuse the n-type dopant a little bit deeper than the end of range damage. So we we tend to try to try to get a little bit of diffusion after we've done an ion implant. Sometimes that can be helpful, because why would that matter? Well, here's my end of, I've, I've done a, an overlay. This is a cross-section TEM micrograph. And here's my end of range damage, this little black dislocation bar. And he, imagine I, I, I diffuse this arsenic just a little deeper. So now I have an N plus region that goes just below the end of range damage. And then below that I have P. Well, this is N plus, this is P. The depletion region, again, uh, always tends to extend. If you remember your NP or PN junction physics, the depleted region is going to be in the lightly doped side where the yellow is. So the yellow is depleted of free carriers. And you know in the depletion region, that's where you get the most amount of recombination of electrons and holes to create leakage in a PN junction. So depletion region is the last place you want damage or defects because in a depletion region, electron hole recombination is very efficient. So what we do, what people do, this is kind of cheating, but they cover up the end of range damage with a heavily doped region. So if you see people making source strain junctions, they often diffuse it just a little ways beyond the EOR, and then they get diodes that are pretty good, reasonably good. If they don't diffuse it at all, they say, oh, I'm going to have a perfect anneal, no diffusion. Um, in fact, then the, the N plus junction might have been back here, and then the EOR might have been in the yellow region, in the depletion region the end of range damage, and you could get a lot leakier diode. So this is there's a lot of optimization when people activate source drains or something uh, where they care about leakage. They, um, there's a lot of optimization in just exactly how much damage uh, dopant diffusion do I allow and how much time do I allow to, to, um, to try to, uh, to um, get rid of these loops. 
Um, and and it's so it's kind of an interesting damage annealing is an interesting combination between knowledge of uh, p n junction physics and and electronic recombination mechanisms and knowledge of the crystal structure and what kind of damage you've created and you need to optimize that because you'll never get rid of all damage to a certain extent for every single implant. Some implants are easier to kneel than others. Okay, so that was in terms of, I, I, I spoke there quite a while about trying to get rid of damage because I wanted to get good PN junctions. I want to get low leakage. Okay, that's only one requirement is, a, is low leakage uh, in the crystal. I also want to activate the doping. You know, you want to implant 10 to the 15th arsenic atoms per square centimeter. You'd like to get 10 to the 15th electrons per square centimeter. You'd like to have all of that activated or boron. That's the whole reason you're putting it in. You don't care about boron in the lattice. It's the holes that it produces uh, or the electrons that, that arsenic produce. Well, it turns out uh, if you amorphize the substrate, and again, this only applies to silicon. Gallium arsenide is just the opposite. But if you amorphize the silicon, that we, we mentioned that solid phase epi is an ideal way of repairing the damage and also getting the dopants onto substitutional sites. If you don't amorphize, so you do a lower dose that does a lot of damage but doesn't create an, an amorphous layer so you can't have SPE, it turns out that activation is a lot more complex because you create defects that are somewhat stable over time and temperature. So here's just an example of a plot of the annealing characteristics of arsenic and silicon I took out of your textbook. And the y-axis here is the fraction active. So if I, if I want to be up to 1, if I'm at 1, that means every single arsenic atom that I implanted contributes an electron, and they're all electrically active. And this is as a function of, of, of tep annealing temperature. Uh, and there are different doses shown here. So the red curve assumes I've amorphized the silicon. And look at this, very interesting. At 550, 525, I can activate, for a 1E15 implant, I can activate almost 80%. That's pretty good. And if I increase the temperature up to 800, it doesn't actually activate much more. So if I want to do a really low temperature anneal in silicon, I can do that with a 1E15 implant. I get, you know, except for 20% of my atoms, I get them active. But let's say I only implanted 1E14 instead. At that same temperature, only 10% are active. Very few. So if I have an a, a intermediate dose, uh, 1E14 might be more typical dose, say, for the source strain extensions might be 1E14, that's a miserable dose because it's, it's low, it's, it's pretty high due with some damage, but it's low enough that it doesn't amorphize. And so to activate the extensions here, this 1E14 dose, you really need to get up to 750, 800, or whatever uh, to get 80% activation. Uh, so don't, we don't just think, oh, for any implant I want, I just do a certain uh, anneal and I'll get the same results. It really depends on the, the amount of damage I did. Um, and whether I was below or above the amorphization threshold. Here, the, if you go to really do low doses, it's a piece of cake again. Here at, at 10 to the 12th, it's not bad because you did so little damage, even at 600, 700, you can get pretty close to 80 to 100% activation. So the tough spot is this intermediate dose regime, which is exactly the dose regime where we're iron implanting sore strain tips or sore strain extensions. And those need to be active as, as full as possible. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it does make our life a little more challenging. That was arsenic. Uh, that actually isn't that bad. Even more complicated is boron. Um, and again, I took this uh, plot from your textbook. Uh, it's the same kind of plot. Now I'm on a, um, a semi-log plot. So I've got a, a log scale on the y-axis and temperature uh, of annealing on the x-axis. And different doses again. Um, so for boron, if you have a low dose up here, 8 times 10 to the 12th, again, at 550, 600, I can get oh, maybe 70 or 50 to 60% active. You know, not, not that great, but, but not terrible. Uh, interestingly, at the very high dose regime, 2 times 10 to the 15th, if I kneel at very low temperatures, say 500, um, I get a reasonable active. Well, it's not very good. It's only 1 in 10, but it actually goes down. It actually goes down in a certain temperature range between 550 and 700. So you're actively reverse annealing. You're taking the dopant atoms off site, and then finally it takes up again when you, it takes off again when you get up above about um, 750 or 800. So to get full activation of boron, you really need to be in silicon at, um, at almost any dose. You need to be in the high temperature regime, 900 or above. And, and that's a real problem. That's why you will see, hear people say, oh, boron is hard to activate. In general, it requires higher temperatures or some kind of more sophisticated annealing technique than arsenic. And that's because of the type of damage it does. It does not tend to amorphize. 
uh, unless you go to really high doses, it's very hard to get an amorphous. And so you cannot take advantage as easily of the solid phase epi regrowth. Um, now, one thing you can do, you say, okay, boron doesn't amorphize, what could I do? People do something called pre-amorphization. So before they implant a boron profile, they might implant a high dose of silicon, amorphize the crystal to a certain depth, then to put the boron in by implant, and then regrow the whole thing by SPE. And you can cheat that way in some sense, or, or you, it's an extra step, but then you can get a little better annealing characteristics. But this is assuming you didn't do any pre-amorphization. This is just implant the boron at this dose and try to anneal it. Um, so what is this reverse annealing behavior? Um, well, uh, it's probably, oh, there's a typo here. It's thought. There's a T missing. It's thought to occur because there's some kind of competition here between the, the native interstitial point defects, um, uh, it, you know, the, the things that you're creating. Remember, you create more point defects as you raise the temperature, uh, and the boron atoms themselves for the lattice sites because, again, we did not amorphize the crystal. We just created a lot of damage. Um, so there's a sort of range where you just don't want to be annealing uh, here at this dose of 2 times 10 to the 14th, uh, you want to take the boron up higher. The problem with going to higher temperatures, of course, is you get more diffusion. So let me go on to slide 26 and just say a few words. We're going to spend the entire next lecture on this, but on something called transient enhanced diffusion. And, and this is sort of um, exemplified here. Here is a, um, uh, uh, an implant that was done uh, say, uh, of, it could be boron or arsenic, it doesn't really matter at this point, but uh, let's say it's boron. And what we, we see two different anneals. The blue curve, I did um, 1,000 degrees C for 10 seconds. And I got that diffusion profile uh, after I implanted the uh, boron. Um, and now the red curve is two minutes at 800. Um, and so, uh, interestingly, you would think, well, I'm, go I'm annealing it at 800. That's a much lower temperature. The boron diffusion coefficient is down by two orders of magnitude at 800. So even though I'm annealing it for a slightly longer time, it's certainly not 100 times longer or 200 times longer. So you would think that the 800 degrees C profile should be shallower than the 1,000. So D TED, unfortunately, is this strange effect, and we'll talk about how this can happen, um, is that even at lower temperatures, you can even get deeper junctions than you can get at higher temperatures. So this really annoyed people and was quite confusing, and it needs to be explained uh, by this, the, the implant damage and its effect on how the boron diffuses. And in fact, TED today is pretty much the dominant effect that determines junction depths and shallow profiles. It's not so much ordinary diffusion or concentration-dependent diffusion, well, for arsenic maybe, but for boron, everything is, you cannot possibly model a shallow junction unless you know how to model TED. Um, and if I just go on to the next slide, just to show you if, you, if I had given you that problem and told you nothing about TED, and you would have looked up in your book, say, uh, at 800 degrees, um, which is somewhere right around here. Here's the boron diffusion coefficient right at this point. And then at 1,000 degrees, it's up here. And the difference between the two is more than two orders of magnitude. So it's, it's almost a factor of 1,000. So clearly, if you're diffusing at 800, it should be a lot less, uh, a lot shallower junction, um, even if you're doing it for two minutes versus... Uh, 10 seconds. I mean, two minutes is 120 seconds, right? So 10 into that. So I'm doing it 12 times longer, fine. But the diffus diffusion coefficient is 1,000 times, should be 1,000 times slower at 800, but it's not. In fact, it's 1,000 times faster. It's a lot faster. And that whole effect is called transient enhanced diffusion. It results from all the interstitials that were implanted, that plus one interstitials giving rise to 311s and all that. And so the next lecture we're going to spend trying to understand these profiles and their, um, and their time dependence. So let me summarize on slide 28. Basically, so far uh, in this lecture, we said uh, that we can separate the energy loss processes completely independent of each other to first order. We have nuclear processes, which are these uh, billiard ball collisions, and we have electronic drag force. The nuclear stopping dominates when I have a heavy ion uh, over most of its path. For a light ion, nuclear stopping dominates only at the end of, um, of range, at, at very at low energies. Um, it's the nuclear stopping that damages the crystal uh, by the creation of silicon recoils. So it, it knocks silicons off of their lattice sites, and they knock other people, other uh, atoms off. And that creates what's called a collision cascade. 
The damage profile peaks right near RP. Um, if you want to calculate that, you can just maybe 80% of RP gives you a rough idea of the depth of damage. For heavy ions, the damage is more stable. That is, it doesn't tend to anneal out in the ion implanter uh, at room temperature. And there's a tendency for a heavy ion to form an amorphous layer from the surface all the way down to some depth. That amorphous layer can be regrown relatively easily in silicon, not true in other semiconductors, however. Uh, it results in uh, relatively efficient dopant activation. For light ions like boron and phosphorus, below a certain dose, it's difficult to produce an amorphous layer at room temperature. And as a result, the activation of the dopants is a lot more complex. It's very dose dependent and it can be, be temperature dependent in an odd fashion. Um, there is this plus one model for residual damage that says that there's roughly one excess interstitial for every primary ion that I ion implanted. So it's relatively um, easy order of magnitude estimate. And this is after the initial vacancy and interstitial recombination has taken place, which only takes a few fractions of a second. These excess interstitials, however, they cluster into little 311 defects. Those defects dissolve at a relatively slow rate on the order of 10 seconds to minutes. And it's those little, that's that 311 um, evaporation or d d dissolution that gives rise to the time dependence of TED. So by understanding 311 defects to a certain extent, we can understand the, the time dependence of TED. And in fact, by understanding 311 defects, we'll be able to come up with a model that could predict this um, kind of strange looking uh, behavior. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to go through today. Um, there were three handouts, make sure you got them. Today's lecture notes, homework number four, which is due on November 2nd, and the solutions to homework number two. The solutions have been on the web for a while, I just forgot to hand out the paper copy. Okay, so we'll see you uh, next Tuesday. Hopefully uh, we get to watch the World Series.